Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. Life, faith, together. Mark 12, 28-34 The Greatest Commandment One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Amen. Has anyone ever asked you if you are religious? Or, or, or even worse, been, have you ever been labelled religious? Uh, when people ask me what I do as a profession and I say I'm a pastor or, or I'm a minister, uh, they, they, they often reply, oh, I'm not religious. Uh, and I always respond by saying, no, am I. I. I don't like religion. Jesus hates religion. You see, being a follower of Jesus is it, not about being religious, about doing certain religious activities. It's all about being in a relationship with God. It's all about loving God and loving people. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 28, we read, One of the teachers of the law came and heard him debating, noting, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, Of all the commands, which is the most important? So Jesus is in the temple, and this teacher of the law, this rabbi, rabbi, comes up to Jesus and asks him a question. Now, a teacher of the law is, is kind of the equivalent to a, a Bible scholar or theologian today. You know, the, 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 the academic who has more PhDs than he needs, the geek who reads all the footnotes. You got the picture. And, and they were experts in the Jewish law. That's the law of Moses. That, that's the Ten Commandments and so on. They, they're an expert in the law. And having heard that Jesus has answered all the religious leaders so well, given them such good answers, he comes to Jesus with his question. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, the rabbis had worked out that there are 613 commandments in, in, in the law of Moses. There are 365 negative commands, you shall not. And there are 248 positive commands, you shall. That's a lot of commandments. To make things even worse, the rabbis have decided to expand the law. In order to apply the law to every area of one's life with great detail and precision, they have added hundreds and hundreds of rules and regulations known as the oral law. And with so many commandments, it's important for, you know, for, for the rabbis to, to know which are the weightier the more important, and, and, and which are the lighter, less important commands. And so the rabbis are constantly debating amongst themselves on the relative weight of the various commands. But also with so many commandments, it's important to have some kind of single sentence that, that sort of gathers up the whole law into a single sentence that would describe the, the very essence of the whole law, that, that, that would to describe the, the underlying principle, the essential principle behind every single command. 
And so when this rabbi asked Jesus this question, he's asking for that sentence. That, that sentence that would describe the whole essence of the law. And so Jesus responds by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 to 5. And so we read in verse 29 to 30, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And so Jesus is quoting an essential Jewish creed uh, known as the Shema. Uh, the Shema is a Hebrew word that means hear, coming from the first line, hear, O Israel. And devout Jews in that day and even today will recite the Shema two times, twice, every day, once in the morning, once in the evening. And, and Jesus is saying, that this is the essence of the whole law. That, that God is one and He deserves our total, wholehearted devotion and worship. That, that, that we need to love God with everything, with the totality of our being, with every fiber, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And when we're doing that, we fulfill every single command in the Old Testament. This is the essence of every law. You see, following Jesus is not about obeying rules and regulations. It's not about being religious. It's not about doing this or not doing that. It's about having a living relationship with God. The rabbis had tried to reduce this dynamic living relationship to, to merely obeying rules and regulations. And they were missing the whole heart and the point of the law, to love God with all your heart. You see, if God has created us in His image, to, to reflect His image, then we will, uh, we will only find our fullest meaning and our true selves when we learn to love and worship the one we were designed to reflect. But how? How do we love God with the totality of our being? Is, is it about having that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling and, and, and daydreaming about God all the time? No, that's a mere sentimental love. That's not what the Bible's talking about. To love God with the totality of your being is to choose to let God be first. It's making God the most important thing in your life. That, that the most important thing in your life is to please God. And, and so the question we should be asking ourselves is, is, what does God want me to do? What would please God? And, and how can I do this in a way that will please God? How can I work in a way that will please God? How can I relate to my colleagues in a way that will please God? How can I drive and respond to other people's driving in a way that pleases God? And if we have two choices, uh, we need to be asking, well, God, which choice will please you the most? In other words, it means not living for yourself, but living for God. And in order to do that, we need to know God. We, we need to come to church to hear the Word of God preached. We need to be reading our Bibles so that we can know Jesus, know His priorities, and know what pleases Him. And then we can simply say, okay, if Jesus was here now, what would He do? And then we simply do what He would do. It's that simple but it's not easy. 
Because it goes against every single selfish tendency we have. I sometimes find myself using Jesus to even justify my selfish desires. If I've got a number of choices I need to make, I can be saying, well, I could, I could see Jesus may want me to do this because of this reason, but then he might want me to do that because of... Because of the, and I can try and use Jesus to justify my selfish desires. Or if I'm faced some kind of opposition and, and, and I, I've got two ways to respond, I, I can kind of, again, use Jesus to justify both responses. When I get into situations like that, what I sometimes find very helpful is to rephrase the question. And I ask myself, what would the devil want me to do in this situation? It's amazing how clear it becomes what he would want me to do. Oh, yes, he would, he would definitely want me to take this option. Ah, so if he wants me to do that, then Jesus would want me to do this. And then we simply do what Jesus would do. That's what it means to love God with the totality of your being. Jesus then quotes Leviticus 19 in verse 18. And we read in verse 31, The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. The second. Nobody asks Jesus for his second choice. No one asked him for his top two commandments. So why does he give, give the two? Why does he give his second choice? Because the two are intimately connected. You, you can't have the one without the other. You can't love God if you don't love your neighbor. And it's only by loving God that you truly can love your neighbor. You see, when we, when we n receive that love of God, when we come to the realization that God loves us, forgives us and accepts us, and, and there's, I've done nothing to earn that, I don't deserve it, but yet God accepts me, He loves me, and He forgives me, when you come to that realization, the question suddenly becomes, how can I not love others and accept others and forgive others? And when, when we start loving God, we start loving the things of God. We love the things God loves. And then we realize, well, well, God loves all people, values all people. He loves them so much that he died for them. Then the question is, if that's how God loves them, and if I love God, how can I not love them? The phrase, love your neighbor, in the original context referred to other Jews. It only referred to Jews. Well, at least that's how the rabbis of Jesus' day interpreted. That they, they claimed that it was just referring to Jews. However, when Jesus quotes it, he quotes it without qualification and without limiting the boundaries. In fact, in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus is asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds by telling a story of a Samaritan. Now, the Jews hated Samaritans more than anyone else. A Samaritan was half Jewish. They had intermarried with their enemy, and, and therefore the Jews considered the Samaritans to be worse than their enemy. They considered them to be traitors. They hated the Samaritans. And Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 that we need to love our enemies. Picture that person who irritates you more than anyone else, who rubs you up more than, than anyone else. That, that, that person who, who stands for all the attitudes and the prejudices that you hate in the world. Imagine that person 
Jesus says, that's your neighbor. Love them. Wow. That doesn't come naturally, does it? I mean, when that person walks into the room, you don't get a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. No, you get hot under the collar. How can we love them? How can we love our neighbor, including our enemies? Well, firstly, by the love of God. I just explained it. It's only by loving God and by receiving the love of God. When we receive that love of God and we realize that God loves us and accepts us and we've done nothing to deserve that, then how can we not love and accept our enemy? And when we start loving God, we start loving the things of God. And when we realize that God died for our enemy, if we love God, we love the things of God, then we've got to love our enemy. Now that doesn't mean we have to agree with them or accept their behavior. In fact, if there's been abuse, the most loving thing you can do is report that person so they can get help. doesn't mean we have to agree with them or accept their behavior, but we do have to love them. As the old saying goes, we love the sinner, not the sin. But also by loving ourselves. Notice what Jesus says in verse 31. He says, love your neighbor As yourself. That presupposes that you love yourself. If you don't love yourself and you start treating your neighbor the way you treat yourself, then I feel sorry for your neighbor. We need to love ourselves. What do I mean by that? Well, our culture is constantly telling us that we need to love ourselves, but But the way our culture defines loving ourselves is very selfish. It's all about me time, treating myself. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what the Bible's talking about. What does the Bible mean when it says love yourself? What the Bible means is we start seeing ourselves the way God sees us. We start realizing that, that God has created us just the way He wants us. And that we are precious in his eyes. That we are a child of God. That we are loved. Not perfect, but loved. And when we realize that we are loved, we can start loving ourselves and then we'll be able to love our neighbor. You see, sometimes people can act very loving and kind, but it's very superficial because they actually need to be needed. They they, they need to be validated. Others can act very confident, almost arrogant, because they're overcompensating, because they need to fill a void inside them. You can never love your neighbor if the void inside of you has not been filled. It's only when you come to see yourself the way God sees you that you can start to develop a healthy and secure self-image and then you will truly be able to start loving others. And then, thirdly, by putting yourself in their shoes. Then you can simply put yourself in your shoes, in their shoes, and and ask yourself, how would you like to be treated if you were in that position? And then simply treat them like that. Again, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's seeking the best interest of other people And it's got nothing to do with how they treat you. That's not easy. But imagine what the world would be like if everyone lived like that. 
All the world's problems will, will virtually be solved overnight if people started living this simple rule. The phrase, love your neighbor, definitely includes the poor. If you get to know Jesus, the one thing you will soon discover is he has a bias for the poor and the oppressed. He is constantly hanging out with the poor and the marginalized, standing up for the exploited and the excluded, speaking out against the, the injustices of the rich and the powerful. Constantly helping the poor. And we too are called to help the poor. If, if, you, if you're not helping the poor, you don't love your neighbor. If you're not helping the poor, you don't know the heart of God and you don't love God. And that's why we as a church run the food bank. Because we have a heart for the poor. And that's why we as a church will speak up for, for climate justice because it's always the poor who get affected the most. It's only when we're helping the poor that we are loving God. In verse 32 to 33 we read, Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jesus didn't mention anything about burnt offerings and sacrifices. But it's the logical implication of what he's said. And that must have been quite something for this rabbi to say while standing in the temple in front of all the religious leaders and the priests. For the priests, the most important thing was to express your love for God by making sacrifices. For the rabbis, the most important thing was to express the, your, your love for God by obeying all their rules and regulations to the minutest detail. Both were missing the point. Both were focusing on outward actions, religiosity, looking religious, doing religious rituals, and missing the point. It's all about loving God and loving people. And unfortunately, so often we can lose the plot. We can so easily start reducing our relationship with God to merely doing religious things and activities. And forget the heart of it. It's all about loving God and loving people. So let's not lose the plot. Let's make sure that we always keep the main thing, the main thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it sounds so easy. Love God, love neighbor. But Father, in practice, it's anything but easy. It's simple, but not easy. And Father, we confess that so often it's our selfishness that prevents us from doing both. And Father, won't you forgive us? Won't you help us to love you, not in some kind of sentimental, warm, fuzzy feeling, but to truly live for you, to have you as our priority, to surrender to you, and give us a real heart for other people. And Father, we confess we can't do this. It's hard. And so Father, won't you fill us afresh with your love, empower us by your Holy Spirit, Enable us to love our neighbors, even our enemies. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website, abgavenibaptist.co.uk.